Dita Scari, uh, Dr. Scari joined Boston site in August of 2017, and she completed her doctorate in optometry from Southern California College of Optometry. Prior to her joining Boston site, Dr. Ascari completed her postdoctoral re residency in cornea and contact lens and ocular disease from the Ohio State University Havner Eye Institute, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science. During her residency, Dr. Ascari specialized in managing patients with a variety of ocular surface diseases and corneal conditions using complex contact lens designs with emphasis on scleral lenses. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and is passionate about research and education. Our, our other speaker, Buddy Russell, uh, after a long and distinguished career in, at Emory University, Buddy left academia to accept a position at Thomas Eye Group in Atlanta. In addition to patient care, Buddy is involved in teaching, product development, and validation. He has been certified by JCAHPO since 1986 and is a certified ophthalmic medical technologist. Buddy is also a fellow member of the Scleral Lens Society. He lectures frequently at national and international meetings on contact lens related topics. Buddy has written articles for various publications, two chapters for CL CLSA's advanced training manual and is a peer reviewer for eye and contact lens and on edit editorial board of the contact lens science and research publication. He is a contributing editor for CSLA's Eyewitness Journal. Buddy serves as the National Contact Lens Coordinator for the NIH-sponsored infant aphakia treatment study. His most recent accomplishments include being awarded the Joseph Soper Award for Excellence in Education and co-authoring a chapter in Taylor and Hoyt's Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Textbook. So we're so glad to have both these speakers tonight. And to start it off, I'll have uh, Mr. Russell uh, start with the next slide, uh, with the first slide. Buddy, are you there? Yeah, let's try to advance. Okay. You had a couple of housekeeping things, I thought. Okay. Nope. Um, we, we're going to keep get started, and then um, we might we'll have some questions um, at the end. We'll tie it up. Okay. Great. Okay. So Karen asked me to start this thing off. Recently, I was kind of challenged to put together a new talk for me, at least, and I had the idea of trying to take every scleral lens that's out there and kind of compare. And I know Karen Lee and some associates of hers at Houston had done that, so I didn't want to. Uh, reciprocate work that's already been done. So I started thinking about, do we have the perfect scleral? And if so, what is it? Uh, if if we don't, what would be the things that we would be looking for to have what, in my opinion at least, would be the perfect scleral? And I think the first bullet is, in my opinion, the hardest part is to get complete alignment around the scleral or around the conjunctiva, of course. 360 degrees and not compromise anything as far as that relationship of the haptic. In addition to that, be able to provide an, uh, a visual acuity that's uncompromised, whether it be a spherical correction or a front toric correction, or maybe even higher order aberrations, multifocals. All this sort of uh, is a dream. Uh, in addition to that, thinking about corneal alignment, those of us that put uh, these lenses on some of these weird topographies, we know that it's very difficult to get an alignment across through the visual axis. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Chris Nett's always been preaching to me and, and others, of course, about the shape of the limbus being more like a Pringle instead of a, a round or an oval. So, uh, you know, thinking about those things. In addition, uh, sufficient oxygen, there's plenty of evidence in the literature. We know to minimize the clearance we know to use a very high permeable piece of plastic uh, and minimize the thickness. Also to have a wettable surface, whether or not uh, the use of hydropeg or any lens that we put in the eye to maintain the wettability and of course be easily maintained. So to kick this thing off, just kind of thinking about what is the perfect scleral? With that in mind, I think there's some clinical things just to kind of touch on. 
doesn't matter what type of scleral lens that you're using, what design, what you're comfortable with. Uh, I think for all of us, there's a couple of reminders. It, uh, we're all busy, you know, that's a given. But to give ample time spent on the front end will save us time and a lot of problems in the back end. So even despite you being busy and multitasking and whatnot, to spend that time necessary on the front end is, is extremely important. You know, I've reached the point and at, at this point, uh, I pretty much do my over refraction uh, within a very short period of time after the lens has been on. Uh, one of the reasons for that, especially if you're dealing with ocular surface disease, many of these people are, are putting ointments and various medications in their eyes. And if you allow them to sit around for an hour or two, you may see this sort of picture and you're not going to be able to improve the visual acuity to get a good endpoint on the refraction. I know studies have been done a couple of years ago to, to kind of validate this, that despite the sinking, I think in the paper it was 86 microns was the average, that the relationship and the power is still determined through the curvature of the base of the contact lens. So the depth really will sink and you can evaluate fit. But when it comes to evaluating visual acuity and doing an over refraction, I do it relatively soon. Five, 10 minutes doesn't bother me. They don't have to sit around an hour or two before you do that. In addition to that, uh, being in a referral center, I think it's very important to document baseline findings. Many attending physicians uh, for patients are maybe not in the same clinic where you are. So to document and, and basically cover yourself, such as if you see microcystic edema in a transplant, to know that that was there before you ever started contact lens wear and then be able to evaluate. Maybe even on this side, make a decision of whether or not, even though they're there for a scleral lens, is it truly safe? It doesn't even have to be that bad of a situation. It could be just the appearance of the eye, such as in this case. If you looked at this on a baseline before you ever applied a contact lens and you didn't really pay attention to this area until they came back for follow-up, you might be somewhat concerned that you've landed the lens a little harsh in that area and cut off some sort of blood supply there and blanch the vessel out. So I think it doesn't matter what type of lens that you're using. These are certainly some just clinical things to, to, to think about before you ever start into the process of fitting a scleral contact. Dita? Oh, I got one more. Yeah. This was a bad <laughs> trick. This was a bad trick. Uh, you know, the girls put me up to talking about makeup. I simply made the point that you know, it's 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 kind of difficult when you're really badly in a situation that can be remedied quite easily. Here we are doing the best that we can to provide the best fitting lens and the maximum acuity. And to have a conversation when you evaluate the lid margin of those who wear makeups and makeups and what they're putting around their eyes, any lanolin based moisturizer or that glitter cosmetic powder that gets into the tear film can certainly contaminate the, the surface of the contact lens. And, and as a result, vision's gonna suffer. I think it's one thing to, to also discuss how do you clean your hands? What do you clean your hands with? And as we uh, go forward here, it's not wanting me to advance. Alan, could you advance the one slide? It's not letting me. Yeah, just to use the basic hand soaps, and this is true with all lenses, of course. Use Neutrogena, use Ivory, use something that doesn't have some sort of moisturizing or a fragrant that you can transfer over onto the contact lens. And even the tools, if you're using application and removal tools to remember, that is also a source that can contaminate the lens surface and thus impact how well a patient does. Data. All right, perfect. Thank you, buddy. Um, so let me see here. Perfect. So I'm going to be going over a quick review of the fundamentals of the fitting algorithm and customization parameters available with the Boston Site Clarel. For those of you who are familiar with our fitting sets, uh, this will be a quick review for you. And for the, those of you who are not, I think it'll, you'll find it useful as well. So first and foremost, we have our fitting sets separated for the right and left eye. 
because through years of fitting here at Boston Site, we've recognized that the right and left eye are not perfectly symmetric. They do have variances in their tericities. The nice part about this fitting set and what makes it so simplified is that regardless of the K readings, regardless of the condition, be it a dry eye patient or an ectatic cone, you start with the standard lens in the center. And let's say you need more or less clearance based on how that lens is resting on the eye. You can go up to increase the sag value or go down. Let's say you want to flatten the haptic profile. So when you have the lens on the patient's eye, it is too tight. You would go to the left of the fitting set. And by contrast, if it is too flat, you can go to the right of the fitting set. So one thing I definitely wanted to talk about is uh, front surface eccentricity, which I think is a tremendous tool that we have available for the Boston Site Scleral. Even before I came working at Boston Site uh, directly, I can't tell you the number of patients I had who benefited from this technology from a other scleral lens which did not offer front surface eccentricity. So I'll tell you that the built-in tericity we have for all of our lenses in the trial set is that we deemed it an out value of eccentricity of one. We do have two other levels of eccentricity, lower and higher. The lower one is zero, the higher one we label two. We do separate them between the right and left eye as well. So perfect application for this would be, let's say you have a patient, you put the regular trial lens on, with the eccentricity one value, and you're not getting the optimal level of vision correction you had hoped for. You can then grab your right and left lens with the lower eccentricity value, or you can grab the higher lens, I'm sorry, the lens with the higher eccentricity value. Now, very regularly, I hear doctors asking me, well, how do you know which one to start with? Well, I, my rule of thumb is the more regular the cornea is, so let's say it's a regular dry eye patient you're sitting, I would start by going to the lower eccentricity first. And if it's a very ectatic cone, for instance, then I would start by going to the higher eccentricity first, after the eccentricity one, of course. So the distinct advantages of the Boston site scleral, aside from the right and left diagnostic fitting set and the front surface eccentricity we offer is that our haptic profile is based on the spine curl, te spine curl technology. So we are able to manipulate the haptic profile much more specifically. We of course offer quadrant specific toric profile. All of our lenses and our trial lens sense have a built-in level of toricity based on uh, information derived from our in-house fittings over many years. I'm going to be talking about the smart channel technology, which I know a lot of you are excited about. And uh, we already talked about the front surface eccentricity. So really quickly, I just wanted to put this in here. It is a um, copy of the patent that we have with the channels available with pros, which uh, this patent goes back to 2010. I can tell you we've been using channels. I, I use them a lot. I can't put a percentage on it, but I would say at least half my patients, at least ocular surface disease patients, I add channels for. And we'll dive into that later on once we get to the channels portion of this, um, of this talk. So let's dive right in for the good stuff. Well, this first thing I want to talk about, I, I felt like it was important to just talk about it right off the bat because it's one of the most commonly encountered characteristics of a fit. And for somebody who is just starting out as sitting or somebody who may not see this as regularly, it can be quite alarming to appreciate. So what is conjunctival hooding? For one, you know, sometimes some people call it conj prolapse. It really doesn't matter. Uh, it's basically when the conjunctival tissue is forced into the tear reservoir during lens wear. It usually happens inferiorly because that's where most lenses decenter. And it's commonly associated with a tight haptic. What I tell all my uh, students and residents who come through is imagine this conj, you know, it wants to go somewhere. And if the haptic is too tight, where is it going to go? It's going to find its way up into that tear reservoir because it's got plenty of room to hang out. And that's where you get that conj hooding. You can get it anywhere where you have excessive, excessive amount of peripheral clearance, but inferior is the most common area. And of course, patients with conj chalases, and by that logic, increased age are more susceptible to this. 
So what it really comes down to is why do we care about crunch hooding? Why is it so alarming? Do we chase it all the time? And can you finalize a fit with hooding? For one, we know that there's no acute risk present with conjunctival hooding. So, but we do know that there is a risk for peripheral neovascularization and long-term wear. Now, I really wanna emphasize the fact that there's no acute risk when you have hooding because let's say a patient comes in, the fit is beautiful, they're happy with their vision, they tell you, doc, I'm in love with this lens, it's working so great for me, and you see hooding. You take that lens off, the hooding recedes, and there's no neovascularization there, there shouldn't be any staining, um, and the patient is comfortable. Now, what you can do with this is you can chase it and you can adjust this fit as much as possible, which I'll talk about in a minute on how to do that. But sometimes, no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, the conch hooding can be incessant. So I, I am not one to withhold finalizing a fit um, just because there is conch hooding there because I recognize that it's something that can be monitored. So here's a great example of a patient of mine in clinic. I did not fit him originally for that lens you see on the left. This is someone who failed to return for, oh gosh, I think it was at least five years he had not returned to clinic. Um, this is someone with advanced keratoconus. He really came in without complaints of comfort. He was, he was doing fine with the lens. He thought, well, gee, it's time for me to come in. Well, if you look at this fit here, you can see that there's a clear area of hooding and that peripheral neovascularization beautifully maps out where there was more hooding. So the reason I bring up this case is, yes, there is neovascularization there. And yes, it does raise a bit of a yellow flag, if you will, that something needs to change. But, you know, it took him 11 years to get to this point. Now, I'm not advocating that this is acceptable. I'm not saying it's okay. But thinking big picture goal with what you're trying to do for your patients is give them better quality of life so they can function. And if it takes 11 years and you see this much neovascularization, I'd say you've come out you know, helping the patient tremendously. As a side note, I am of course refitting this patient um, just to address it so I don't really have to worry about it at all ever again, or at least for the time being. Um, this is another example of conch hooding. You can see it's clearly more severe than the patient I had before. What's uh, interesting here is when you remove the lens, you see there is no neovascularization there at all. This cornea was pristine, the patient is very happy, and this is someone who's been wearing the same lens design for seven years. So the reason I brought this case up in contrast to the case I just mentioned is that we really sometimes, at, at least clinically, we can't always determine who is going to be developing more per peripheral neovascularization than the other uh, than another patient. I'll tell you, this patient had ocular surface disease, and usually we think they're more susceptible, but sometimes they really do prove me wrong. And this is a beautiful example of how we monitored it, and the patient really did all right. So let's say, you know, the, the point of this is figuring out how to troubleshoot these, these findings. And if you remember when I first started, I talked about it's because of the increased clearance in that area and the tight haptic that you get this conjunctival tissue which creeps in. By that understanding, you would reduce any amount of excessive clearance, reduce the peripheral clearance, and increase the overall diameter and or loosen the haptic profile to kind of give the conjunctival more room to stay in the haptic portion as opposed to creeping in into the tear reservoir. And that's exactly what I did for this case here. And you can see the end result was successful. If you're wondering how much I went larger, I simply did a half a millimeter for this patient. Um, and if you're questioning what the condition was, it was an RK patient with some, some particularly unique scarring in the center there. So next we'll talk about lens decentration, which is also a very common finding when you're fitting sclerals, especially if they're a larger diameter. So the three key reasons that lens decentration happens is one, because of eyelid anatomy, two, because of the inherent juricity of the sclera, and lastly, because you may have excessive limbal clearance in your lens fit. So how do you assess for lens decentration? How do you know if your lens isn't lining up well? well you look at the tear layer, you may appreciate a tear prism. 
you look at your fluorescein distribution beneath the lens, and you look at the degree of scleral coverage. When these are asymmetrical, you will, know, you will confirm that your lens is decentered. So in the photo on the bottom left, uh, you see that there's an excessive amount of clearance inferiorly. So you have a base down prism, and that tells you the lens is decentered inferiorly. In the, center, in the photo in the center, there's an excessive amount of clearance inferior temporally and minimal superior nasal with some touch. And that tells you this lens is decentered inferior temporal. And the last photo, um, all the way on the bottom right, you can see that the, the amount of sclera coverage with the lens is more so temporally than nasally, meaning this lens is, again, getting pushed temporally. So this is a beautiful schematic that Dr. Carasquillo actually provided me, um, which, which beautifully lays out how to troubleshoot or assess for lens decentration. So if you'll visualize with me here, that red line you see is the patient's ocular surface. The top left of the photo is the cornea. The bottom right is going towards the sclera. And you have the lens outlined in the two black lines there on top of the eye. You can see as you're looking at the space between the back black line and the red line, that is your tear layer. And you can appreciate that it's asymmetric. Now, the point I want to emphasize here is if you imagine this is the inferior haptic of a lens, when you have this on a patient's eye, it will appear as if it is digging in to the inferior conge. You will appreciate an area of impingement, which can be quite tricky. It can be very misleading because you'll be tempted to think, gee, this lens is really tight inferiorly. I should flatten it. I challenge you to think dynamically about this fit assessment and push the lens up with your finger. I like to use my thumb grab the patient's lower eyelid, and gently press up. When you do that, you will see that the tear layer will become more fluid, more symmetric, and you will also appreciate an area of edge lift inferiorly, which confirms your suspicion that the inferior haptic is actually too loose and needs to be steepened for the lens to be better centered. And by that, you get a more uniform clearance pattern and a properly aligned lens. Next, we'll talk about a tippy toe fit or what I like to call a fat belly fit. I don't know, honestly, when I started calling it that, but when, when you look at this photo here in, in the center, you can see that the weight distribution is just in the outer portion of the haptic. When I explain this to students and residents, I always say, imagine someone wearing pants that are just way too tight and their belly's just kind of flopping over it. So this is due to a lens being decentered and there's a high amount of peripheral clearance there. So the con just gets really bulky, really full. It gets congested in that area. And you'll appreciate it in the direction of decentration. And of course, this is very cosmetically unappealing. Patients will come in and tell you, God, my eyes just look really beefy. They look red. And they may be comfortable, but they, may, they will definitely tell you that they're not liking the way their eyes, their eyes look with this. So this is a great schematic courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Sharag Patel. And if you look at this photo here and try to imagine with me, that blue line is the ocular surface of a patient. The two black lines, again, are the lens. And the space in between is the lens reservoir or the tear reservoir. The area highlighted or scribbled in orange is what's supposed to symbolize the congested conjunctiva. And that occurs because you have an excessive amount of clearance there Subsequent to that, you have this tippy-toe fit where it's compressing on the very edge. So how do you address this? You bring down the peripheral points of, at the limbus, excuse me. You bring down those, the area where you have too much clearance, and you raise or flatten the peripheral haptic portion. And again, that allows you to have a more fluid clearance and less of that conjunctival congestion. And the main goal, again, is to distribute the landing along the entire haptic. So this is something I definitely wanted to make sure we talked about here because I think it is so important to um, acknowledge it. And sometimes it can really trick practitioners. Uh, and I think the best way for me to explain it is really to give you an example. So this is a patient of mine. You can see it's a very sick eye. He has severe atopic carotid conjunctivitis with keratoconus, 
history of repeat high drops. Um, so when I fit him, I fit him as best as I could at this time, and he was actually doing very well with it. He was comfortable with the lens. He presented with no complaints. While I was assessing the fit, however, I noticed that when he looked to his nasal gaze, now this is his right eye, when he looked to the nasal gaze, you can see this jarring and honestly alarming uh, level of blanching in the mid haptic portion or in, in the edge of the lens. So this is exactly what pseudo compression is. It's when you have a high peripheral clearance or a loose design and it causes the lens to shift. So what's happened in this patient's eye is this lens is actually too loose. So when he looks to the left, the lens harshly lands to his right or temporarily. Now this is pseudo compression. This patient had no rebound hyperemia, no staining on removal. And uh, this is why I felt it was really important to mention this because you can chase your tail with this kind of fit, constantly trying to flatten or loosen the fit when in fact it's too loose to begin with. Go ahead, Yeah, Betty. and Bita, yeah, Bita, while you're talking about the decentration, I'm just uh, thinking as far as optics of the lens, uh, you know, as you know, when you get a lot of tear prism, you get some funny over refractions. Uh, do you feel like it's more important to optimize the fit and get the, the centration right before you say implement two or three doctors of seal onto the front surface of the lens? Where do you stand on that? I absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, the, first of all, the when you do have a lens that's descendered, it can do some funky things optically, as you said, including cylinder. Um, additionally to that, if you are putting in a cylindrical overfraction, if you're making your front surface the lens and then you adjust the fit, the lens can move. And then once the lens moves, you've essentially, you know, that, that lens is not going to function the way that you want and the patient's going to see poorly. So I think optimizing the fit as best as you can, aligning it, centering it as best as you can, and then incorporating the cylindrical correction would be best. Okay, great. Uh, you know, if you go back to the days of even corneal contact lenses, one of the ways that we assess fluorescing patterns is with the fluorescing in the eye, go ahead and let's say, for instance, that the corneal lens is decentered, let's say inferior. With fluorescing in the eye, you take and put the lens where you want it to be, in that case, move it up. And what you'd probably see is this dark arcuate sort of band there, meaning that there's some curve on the back of that lens that's steeper than the curve you're trying to fit adjacent to it. So it's a similar rule with uh, not only corneal gas perms, but also scleral contact lenses. So when you look at something like this, <clears throat> you know, my first thought is I got a graft, so it may be a funky shape where it's more elevated superior. But my first thought when I look at this has to do with it's probably decentered inferior. So if you look at it and you've got corneal touch and the lens is centered properly, we obviously have to increase the depth and get off that high point. But in this case, if you were to take and move the lens up and then that clearance actually exists there, this is something that you need to pay attention to instead of just looking at it and saying, well, it's not deep enough, I'm touching the top of the uh, cornea. So in the same respect, Many of these uh, profiles, as I mentioned, the perfect scleral, if you think about through the visual axis, do we have any designs that would actually mimic that topography? And the answer is probably not. So this is just a case where if you look at the slide on the top left side, you can see we've got some clearance here over the apex of this ectatic cornea. Yet when you look out into the peripheral and you put some values to it, we've got some really high clearances here. Now, the important part is to just simply mention, if you're not touching the most elevated portion, even after the lens sinks, many times we have to live with these excessive, in our opinion, at least excessive clearances. And if you look, this is a 23 millimeter lens that was actually designed in 1993, and they do quite well. So I think the teaching point here is sometimes you cannot avoid having some unique features about the clearance looks good over the high point, and despite what our best efforts may be, we have to live with some excessive clearances in some other areas. So 
you know, one thing that Lynette Johns, I can't get past this. She always, always has preached, and, and even from a bar stool 20 years ago in Boston, buddy, the secret is in the haptic, and the whole key to scleral lens is no sign left behind. So upon removal, you can see the, uh, the eye, and the eye is just as quiet as it could be. The cornea is clear, the conge is clear, that eye is just so quiet. Always, always take the time just because they say, buddy, I'm doing great. I have no complaints. That doesn't mean you turn off and start thinking about the next patient. Take the time to remove the lens and look for any sign that is left behind that you may need to address. Uh, Vita, I think you got something you might want to add to that. Yes. So uh, I agree with everything you said. They're beautifully laid out. My, uh, my focus in clinic is always to look at the big picture function of a lens. So, you know, of course, when you see a lens like this, it can be alarming. Oh, my goodness, there's so much clearance there. There's a risk for hypoxia, et cetera. But clearly, you know, the, the function of a lens is beyond what you measure with the corneal vault. And we say this so much in our clinic. And the reason we believe in this is because we see these patients, like this case here, where they've been wearing the same lens design since 1993, and they are doing perfectly fine. So uh, we're not advocating that you fit like this, but I ask that you maintain an open mind in recognizing that there are certain things with the fit, as Buddy said, that we simply cannot avoid. And when we accept it and the entire function of a lens is there, then who are we to stop the patient from wearing it? So next I wanna talk about uh, some anatomical obstacles that you may encounter in clinic and how to troubleshoot around them. So by and large, the most common anatomical obstacles we encounter, I think, are pinguiculas and uh, pterygiums as well. But after that, we're, we're talking about tube shunts, which in this population that we deal with in patients with ocular surface disease, it's relatively common to see them with concomitant glaucoma. So these can be very challenging with scleral lens fitting because, because they can uh, you know, be a nuisance. It can be challenging to fit around them, and the patient might have redness or discomfort. So what are we trying to achieve? What we're really trying to do is either go over the obstacle or go around it. Now, the best way, again, is to just go over it with an example with you guys. So this is a patient of mine in clinic who presented uh, with some mild pinguecula there nasally, and he had failed with the other spiral lens design, which was a 17 millimeter design. And you can see here in the nasal aspect that pinguecula is just getting, you know, the lens is just digging in right there. And this is someone, he, he was very, he's a very kind patient, and he really did try to wear this lens, but he, from the outside provider, and he couldn't because it was just too uncomfortable for him in that area, although he had amazing vision potential with it. So seeing that the pinguecula there was mildly elevated, I would consider this more of a mild to moderate pinguecula. I decided, well, what if I just try going bigger and seeing if that takes care of it? So I went two millimeters bigger. I fit him with a 19 millimeter lens. And you can see there nasally, it just, what it's doing is it's softening the landing over this pinguacula by having a wider weight distribution. And this patient did very well with this lens design. Next, I want to talk more in detail about this smart channel technology, which we're offering now. Um, it's a tool, as I said earlier, I use it a lot in clinic to fit over anatomical obstacles, of course, but I also use it a lot to relieve suction in lenses. And uh, I, as I said earlier, we'll dive into that some more in a minute. So how do you use the smart channel technology? How can you do this and incorporate it into your lens designs for your patients? Well, step one is what we've always encouraged you to know what you have to do for designing a lens with the Boston Sight Scleral in making your adjustments, whether it's online or if you want to call in the order, what have you. After you've completed your design, you finalize your fit for the patient. You make sure your haptics are aligned. You're happy with it. The fit is stable. You, of course, mark down the dot location with your slit lamp. 
And the last step is you go to your Fit Connect again to order your lens design with the smart channel. So you simply click the add channel button here. You can add up the four of them. You write down, uh, you dictate exactly where you want it to start, where you want it to end, and how deep you want to have this channel. And yes, this is new, and you have a lot of control over this with the Fit Connect technology. When in doubt, you know that you can always call our consultants. And uh, Manny, of course, is, is always willing to help. So if you guys have any questions or you want to get eased into this, I encourage you to give us a call. So this is an example of a smart channel used. It's actually the same patient, but his left eye. This pinguecula was a lot more elevated. So I didn't think that just going um, bigger or having a wider haptic zone was going to be enough. So what I did is I still went larger to allow for the edge to land beyond the pinguecula, but I also added a deep channel there. Um, and the photo on the left, you can see I've outlined it with an optic section. If you really look closely, you can see a sliver of clearance over it. So it's clearly not touching there. And then the schematic on the right, it just shows how we've uh, designed it. So as far as tube shunts go, um, you know, it's the same concept. You measure, once you have your fit finalized, you have your dot location um, documented. You then use your slit lamp beam to uh, orient your beginning point for this channel and your ending point for this channel. And for this case right here, where I started it at the 45 degrees and ended it at 80 degrees, as you can see in the um, graphical or the table right here. And it was quite a deep channel. Now for something like this, I would encourage you again to call our fitting consultant to tell them exactly how you want it because you wanna make sure that the smart channel is uh, elevated all the way out to the edge so that you're not impinging um, on the conjunctival tissue or the tube. And this is uh, what, I, what I really want to introduce to you guys is um, you, the utility of the smart channel for physiologic function. We are firm believers and we're believers because we've seen it so much in clinic and that suction plays a big role in how these patients wear their lenses in terms of comfort and corneal health over time. Some of you may have seen this case. I think I posted it in the fitters page but this is somebody with a very sick eyes, the Stevens-Johnson syndrome patient. I fit him in this lens and um, I added actually four channels. So I added one in every quadrant. And I think it was about 150 microns of depth for all four of them. This patient wore this lens for 10 months. And you can see the photo on the right is how he's doing now. And it, it's just, you know, it's, this is definitely something I encourage you guys to use. Uh, patients will thank you for it, especially your dry eye patients who go, oh gosh, my lenses, I can't wait to take them out at the end of the day. Or no matter what you do, they get that rebound hyperemia. Consider including channels um, into your fits and your patients, like, like I said, will thank you for them. So last thing I wanna talk about here is redness with lens wear. Uh, I've talked about the one in the middle there, the limbal congestion or the tippy toe earlier on in this talk. But the two other common reasons for redness with lens wear are exposure, as is depicted in that first photo, and that last photo on the right is nasty amount of the impingement. It was pretty harsh, and this patient was forming a hypertrophic ridge there. So how I addressed all of these um, is I simply went bigger. So that photo on the bottom left, you know, the initial lens was relatively aligned and, and, the, and the fit was good. It was just not covering enough of that conge tissue. So I went larger and as you can see, it, it made a world of difference for this patient. That photo in the center there on the top, this is someone with a limbal conge congest with the limbal congestion and tippy toe fit. I brought in the peripheral clearance and I flattened the haptic. And I also went a little bit bigger to widen the landing zone to just make it more of a cushion fit. And in the final case all the way on the right, I again went larger, about a millimeter, and um, I fit over that ridged area and, and the patient just uh, healed quite 
easily and, and well with this lens design. So my point to you is don't be afraid to go bigger. Recognize its utility, especially for patients who have dryness. Um, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with what you find. Yeah, and I think when it comes to, you know, taking the time to really evaluate, no matter what's going on, again, I emphasize that I can arrive to you without complaints, the eye can be quiet, but you've got to remove the lens. I, I feel better about bringing these people back, say, later in the day. It's going to be easier to assess actually what that eye looks like upon removal versus doing it at 8 o'clock in the morning after one hour wear. But any time that you've got some sort of redness or rebound or hyperemia, whatever term you want to use, they'll often describe, buddy, I feel fine with the lens, but upon removal, my eye just feels tender. Uh, does it get red? Or, you know, not always, but sometimes it does. Remove the lens in clinic to evaluate. You've got to find out where that lens, you're not going to get a rebound hyperemia if the lens is too loose. You know, I hear Muriel talks a lot about she's one of the looser fitters or the loosest fitter. Well, I'm in that same school. I'm always going to miss it loose. I may deal with some debris, which Vita's going to talk to you a little bit about, but you will not have the hyperemia or the rebound with a looser lens. The lens is too tight somewhere. You simply find where it is and how much you need to loosen that lens. So always take the time to remove the lens and look for that rebound hyperemia. Beta? Yes, so um, when we're talking about tear debris, this is something that can be very problematic for uh, problematic for patients. I always say, you know, the, the lower their visual acuity is to start with, the more visually devastating it can be. This really does happen uh, when the debris accumulates in the tear reservoir. And I'll tell you that OSC patients are more susceptible. They naturally, they just have a more, for lack of a better word, gunky tear film. So that, those tears just naturally creep in there as a patient is wearing it and can really, like I said, affect their quality of function with these lenses. So, uh, of course, another reason this happens is because you may have an increasingly uh, or a faster tear exchange rate than you would want if the fit is too loose. So what you do with this is you troubleshoot by adjusting the fit, of course, to minimize debris influx. You manage any concomitant ocular surface disease you can. And once you've done everything you can and there's still some fogging left over, you can always consider using a viscous filling agent like a refreshed cellulose gel with the saline per application. So I always uh, like to apply fluorescein to the superior conge as the patient is wearing the lens. I do this because if you apply it superiorly as a patient blinks, you see this beautiful cascade of sodium fluorescein coming in from any vulnerable points. Perfect example is this uh, photograph on your left. You can see that there's a rapid debris influx there. There's a beautiful kind of like a waterfall pattern there with the fluorescing creeping in. And there's an obvious area of edge lift that's causing this issue. But if you put the sodium fluorescein inferiorly, especially if you have edge lift superiorly, you may not be catching it as well. So that's a quick clinical tip. Just be mindful to apply the fluorescein on the superior bulbar conge. So how do you troubleshoot this? You steepen the edge and that will reduce the debris source. Next, uh, what if you put in sodium fluorescein and there isn't this waterfall kind of cascade of it? Maybe it's kind of pooling in the periphery or it, it's a little bit delayed or you have the patient look in different directions of gaze and then all of a sudden you go, huh, there's some fluorescein gathering there. What usually is happening or what's happening in those circumstances is that the lens is actually shifting or rocking because the amount of clearance you have in the periphery is too high. So you're not anchoring down to the sclera as uh, strongly as you would like. And if you're not adhering down, you get this loose fit and it's just wiggling around. And that's when the debris slowly pumps in underneath. So how do you address this? You either steepen the base curve 
or reduce your peripheral clearance because we know that when we steepen the base curve of our optic zone, we bring down those peripheral uh, points. One thing I definitely uh, tell every student, resident, every person who's asking us what our lens is about is to always remember to flip the lids. And the reason for that is because I have been burned enough times where I have it that I now never forget it anymore. Um, for patients, especially your keratoconic patients, uh, we know that sleep apnea, floppy eyelids, they go hand in hand. We know that uh, patients who wear contact lenses in general uh, are more susceptible to papillary reactions. We know these things. So I encourage all of you to be mindful to flip the lids at the baseline exam when you're doing the consult with them and flip the lids in their annual appointments just to keep track of what, how they're doing. In addition to that, if you can take photos, that would be even better. So the photos you're seeing here are courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Shirag Patel, again. Um, it's a beautiful example of just how much mucus and debris can form. And this was not related to the lens fit at all. It was because of a significant level of floppy eyelid syndrome. And this patient was managed with steroids uh, to calm it down as much as possible, but ultimately was sent off to an oculoplastic specialist to try and tighten up the lids and prevent the inflammation from recurring. So next, I wanna uh, talk about another form of ocular surface disease, which can affect your fit. If you look here on the photo on the left, that is a very decentered lens. This is a patient of mine I've been caring for for a couple of years now. Um, she, she's incredibly symptomatic of this debris, at, at least at the point in time where you see these photos were taken. She has terrible allergies, terrible blepharitis, which fluctuates. Um, and what you'll see is when you're taking the lens off, she has these recurrent uh, conjunctival nodules that kind of come and go. They are sporadic. At one point, they'll be superiorly. Another day, they'll be temporarily. I'll be honest, this was the first time I ever saw this, love, this type of inflammation, nodular conjunctival inflammation. But my point in this case is this patient was having this much fogging and debris, and it wasn't because of the lens. It was because of the ocular surface disease. So my point in this case is when you see something like this, as the nodules are present there, it's forcing the lens to lift at that edge. Because the lens is lifting, it's causing the lens to decenter. It's causing a rapid debris uh, influx of uh, debris. So what I did for this patient, instead of chasing the fit and driving myself nuts and never being able to make her happy, I instead managed the ocular surface disease. So we did Avanova a couple times a day. Uh, we did a Toberdex uh, pulse and taper. We maintained her lid hygiene. She actually changed the flooring of her house from carpet to wood. And overall, she's doing a lot better now and the fogging is minimized. But this is really important to keep in mind, as Buddy said, the fit is not done until you take the lenses off the patient's eyes and you'd be surprised at what you find. And last but not least, like I said, if you've tried everything, you've managed the disease, you have um, uh, adjusted the fit, you've optimized it as much as possible, sometimes some patients can have stubborn level of tear debris. So you can always rely on a viscous filling agent to help you get, to help the patient get to their final endpoint. And one thing I wanna remind you is remember to not have preservatives for these filling agents. This is why I recommend Refresh Cellulis. Any type of viscous gel drop you can think of, which is preservative-free, is the way to go. So what we want to do in the last uh, eight, 10 minutes, something like that, is kind of go through just a couple of different pearls maybe that prior to having all the cool toys that, you know, for instance, we got an ESP, you can look at that and see, well, we got a significant amount of uh, with the rule of stigmatism and how much and how loose, loosely it's going to fit through the vertical meridian. So prior to that, when we didn't have those toys, 
you know, we talked earlier about putting fingers in the eyes and whatnot. I'm a spinner, you know, so this is just a video showing a toric haptic on an eye. Before we had the toys, of course, we did all the evaluations and just put a lens on and extrapolate the information, very much like fitting a baby. Uh, so what you see is the flatter meridian being marked by those dots, and it simply follows the path of least resistance. So this lens settles, and we know that that's a with the rule scleral. You can see also the bleeding of the fluorescein outside of the limbus. So if this was a fogging sort of problem, we can see we got a little space to bring it a little closer in that uh, horizontal meridian and in, even inferior. But if you were to rotate it on a spherical or something that needed more of a quadrant specific, you're not going to see it rotate back into that position nearly as quickly. In addition to that, another thing that's frequently used, at least by me, is uh, I think Sophia West uh, talked about this many years ago, is taking a lens while it's on the eye and using the lid. Now, you know, like most anything, you got to see a ton of normals to recognize abnormal. But what you're seeing here is develop uh, a touch, if you will, to see how much pressure that you need to apply right outside of the lens edge. If you've really got to mash hard, that's just a clinical way of kind of confirming this is probably hugging the eye too much. As you push on it and you just barely touch and it stands off, like I say, just I challenge you to work your way around that haptic using the lid, just pushing outside of the lens edge to see how much pressure it takes before you see that lifting off of the lens edge. Now, this is a nasty picture. I apologize for the photography, but what I want to demonstrate here is again, Prior to Fit Connect being upgraded for various things, I had always felt like I was pretty good at determining, let's say in this case, you're happy with the fit, everything's doing okay, but we need to implement some front surface torics. Now I'm going to share something with you that you may feel like you need or you don't need. If you look at this reflection of light using the cross section, you can see I've lined it up with the number one on a Boston sight lens. So if you just kind of take is there a way for me to be more accurate in measuring exactly what that is? So there was a cornea doctor that turned me onto this app that you just go to the app store and download Axis Assistant. So what you do is these little knobs down here at the bottom, you just rotate these knobs and superimpose the gauge to line up with the cross section that you've already got set up with your microscope in that, let's call it click in position, that 90 position so that you you've got it straight on in the proper meridian, so to speak. As you rotate that cross section, you can see that the line of my cross section lines up. And I can tell you that when I tell Manny or go to Fit Connect where my dot is for number one in order to put the cylinder on the anterior surface, it's at 169. Well, of course, on the website, I got to go in five degrees, so I'm going to use 170. We can also implement that sort of technology uh, to even, oh, let's go back one, uh, with the smart channels. As Vita was talking about, now the, uh, the upgrade with the website gives you a little bit more flexibility and you can design where you want to put these channels. But again, what I've done is line up, this is a lady who has multiple removals of a pterygium. Nobody uh, excuse me, she was unable to wear anything. She developed a, quite a bit of irregularity. And with the lens, even fitting it as well as possible, she could wear it better than she had anything else, but I just knew that I could do a little something more. So I take my information of 338 used with the app. And, you know, how does that uh, kind of line up with using the ESP? And you can see the elevation from the pterygium 338 looks pretty good to me. So you also, before the upgrade, had to tell Manny or, or whoever you were speaking with where the one lined up because that's where everything starts in order to put the channel in the right position. Now you can see one option could be, well, maybe I can lift this whole lens up to clear this area out here, but I didn't really want to just from a permeability standpoint, she was doing too well. So 
as you implement this, and again, just some more OCTs of rubbing on this pterygium that's encroaching into the cornea here, this was one of those cases that, again, it's a bad picture, but it's a happy eye. The lady is just ecstatic with the implementation of this technology that's referred to as smart channels. So in closing, I, you know, between me and Vita, thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with you tonight. And this is, I think, where we're going to end up and kind of hand it back to Alan or Karen or Vita or whoever wants to talk. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot, guys. That was uh, very informative. And uh, we thank you for your for participating, uh, everyone who, who logged in. Thank you for your interest and attention tonight. To sign up for a Boston Site Scleral account, um, and if you're interested, if you haven't already, simply go to fitconnect bostonsite.org and click on register for an account. Uh, you can also email us with follow-up questions at bostonsitescleral at bostonsite.org. So uh, our next one will be upcoming in the next couple months and stay tuned for more information on that and we hope everyone has a good night. Thank you very much. Thanks you guys. Have a good night.